Right, now I've got 15 minutes to get through 15 <laughs> slides, which will probably be uh, not quite enough, but we'll do what we can. I'll be talking about the Defence Strategic Goods List, which is essentially the map of what's in or out. I'll also be making some comparisons to the US ITAR and uh, Commerce Control List regimes, just to give you a context of how what's happening in Australia is different to the USA. Now, in terms of my background, for those that don't know me, I've worked for 35 years on and off as a defence analyst. I have got 23 years of experience, military strategy, technological strategy, defence policy. I've done the odd bit of consultancy in the defence sector. I've got over 600 publications in the area. Uh, I'm also co-founder of an independent military and strategy think tank, Air Power Australia. So I've contributed to something like 30 parliamentary submissions and many, many times sat before parliamentary committees and argued about defence policy matters. Now, I have a foot in both camp because, of course, I've been, at least for about 15 or 16 years now, a part-time computer science academic at Monash. So I can sort of look at both perspectives. I do have a considerable amount of familiarity with ITAR because when you work in this sector, even if you're working with unclassified and uncontrolled material in the US, you have to be sensitive to what your US collaborators have to deal with, and in particular that is the constraints of ITAR, what ITAR allows and doesn't allow. Now we can start by asking the question, what is the DSGL? It is the primary document used by the Defence Export Controls Office or DECO to determine whether a product or research is controlled by the legislation. It lists in details everything that is regarded to be controlled. I think the current version was, was 361 pages or depending on what formatting you've got. Might be a few more, a few less. It covers military items in a section called Part 1 and nine categories of what are termed dual-use goods in Part 2. Now, that's what Kevin covered earlier. Mostly, the document is derived from the United States ITAR, that's International Traffic in Arms Regulation, uh, Section 121.1 Munitions List, and uh, the United States so-called EAR Commerce Control List document. So what's happened with the Australian document is that these two disparate US technology control lists, one of which is dedicated to military, one of which is dual use, have been rolled into one. Okay. As far as I've been able to determine, uh, testing our document against theirs, basically it looks to be verbatim copies. There may be additions or exclusions in there that I don't know about, but given that the legislation was in part introduced to align with the trade treaty with the US, to have legal compliance with ITAR and with CCL, um, you would have to have everything that's in ITAR and CCL. Now, the purpose of the ITAR and the CCL is they were designed for regulating primarily commercial and government export of military and dual use goods. The US legislation does not exempt civil servants. If you are a civil servant working for the Department of Defence, you make a mistake and disclose something under ITAR or under the CCL, the FBI will march you out in handcuffs, no differently if you were a defence contractor and you did the same, or some other high-tech contractor working in a dual use area that's regulated. Now, the purpose of doing this was to deny unfriendly regimes the means of acquiring and maintaining US military equipment. Iran's a classic example. They have a significant amount of equipment from the time of the Shah that is still being maintained and used, despite the fact that they are not friends of the United States. They have reverse engineered large amounts of equipment in the process. In other words, they are making 1970s US military equipment. So the idea is to prevent reverse engineering, maintaining, developing military equipment, but also developing advanced technology with potential military applications. You come up with a better infrared imaging chip or you come up with a better ground mapping algorithm for a synthetic aperture radar, you can immediately put that to civil use or you can put it to military use and military uses. I could talk ad nauseum about it. Now, the ITAR and CCL lists were not designed to regulate fundamental research, as it's called in the US, in academia or industry. And 
the CCL at the back of the slides, and this will end up on the web at some stage, I actually have verbatim the exemption categories as described in both ITAR and EAR CCL. Now, while the lists of items in ITAR, EAR and DTCA are pretty much the same, the legislative footprint or the scope is different. Uh, while you have controlled disclosures under ITAR and EAR uh, that will, in, will have some influence on public discourse, a defence contractor can't talk about the detail of how they might have built this or built that, uh, general public discourse academic work is permitted providing it falls into the fundamental research category. So that means under ITAR and in the ITAR system I can talk about how to design an algorithm to guide a missile. In fact, I have a colleague in the US that's published books on this. He's a mathematician, that's all he does. It's all mathematics, uh, but the bottom line is, in Australia, that would be controlled under DTCA because it's applied research, not basic by our definition. Now, if we look at the DTCA, it really follows the Cold War model that the Soviets developed for regulating science and technology. Uh, I think that's probably an accidental outcome, but the bottom line is that uh, we will have to deal with an environment not unlike what Soviet scientists had to deal with during the Cold War and after the Cold War. I have a colleague in the United States that spent 10 years in a Russian prison camp because he fell foul of this legislation. He was working as a defence analyst in the 1990s. He got let loose on prisoner exchange a few years ago. Works for Rusi in the UK now. So this stuff is real and I think the reason why he got into trouble is because he offended a bureaucrat. It's not that what it is that he disclosed was particularly important. He offended a bureaucrat because of the sweeping arbitrary powers in the Russian legislation he just got walked, walked away in handcuffs by the FSB. Now, Kevin mentioned categories. This is pasted verbatim, in fact, from the USCCL. The only difference in our document is the DSGL that we lump category five as telecommunications and information security in the USCCL. It's a part one and a part two. Nuclear materials, materials, chemical microorganisms and toxins, Materials, materials processing, electronics, computers, sensors and lasers, navigation, avionics, marine, aerospace, propulsion. I'm not going to talk about the military list in detail, uh, but it goes through a vast range of things that can be used essentially as weapons or to support weapons. Now, if we look at any of these nine categories in either the CCL or the DSGL, what we will find is in each category five sections, an A, B, C, D and E. And this is almost universally repeated in every one of the categories. Uh, the differences between these sections, they are unique of course to whether it's a, a nine or a, an eight or a six or whatever. But a, a section, systems, equipment and components, that's the actual goods being regulated. Test inspection and production equipment, that is the equipment that you would be using in order to produce these goods. So consider if you were building radars, this would be test equipment that you might use to go and test an antenna for it. Materials, and this is a very extensive list of any material that is of relevance. So if you're building an infrared camera, zinc selenide, zinc sulphide, germanium lenses and blanks, are covered providing they are above a certain performance specification or size. Now, there is also a category D and a category E. Those are the ones that interest us as university academics. The D category deals with any software that can be used. I'll elaborate on that. And the E category technology. So, uh, uh, ultimately, A, B and C are in there to control the ability to produce the controlled goods and D and E are there to control the ability to understand, design, develop, model, define or specify the goods. That includes doing something like writing a technical spec. So, 
The big issue here for us academics is, of course, that the way the DTCA has been written, the D and E sections become what we can call, and I like to use the label, catch-all clauses. In other words, uh, they are intended to pick up anything outside of the goods itself that might be of relevance to using it or producing it or otherwise. And that software, and this is a verbatim quote, specially designed or modified for the development, production or use of equipment, functions or features, specified in whatever the category and to technology to enable an item to achieve or exceed the controlled performance levels for functionality specified by category N. Okay. Now, technology as defined, in fact, both in the CCL, ITAR and the DTCA is any information relating to the design, development, production, manufacture, assembly, operation, repair. Uh, testing, maintenance, modification of the goods, including information such as blueprints, drawings, photographs, plans, instructions, specifications, algorithms or documentation, or software relating to the goods. So that's really anything other than perhaps the existence of the goods themselves. Okay. Now, the purpose of this definition is to both control tangible transfers of hard documents, but also intangible transfers involving the substantial intellectual content to do with the subject of interest, okay? Uh, whether it's the control item itself or anything that falls under these catch-all D&E clauses, okay? So what this means is that other than the exemptions, the very narrow exemptions that we have for dual use publications, and that doesn't apply as far as I recall for anything on the military list under DTCA, uh, it really prohibits any discourse. Now, I have seen a lot of public statements made by defence in parliamentary memos and various other public documents where they've gone out and said, oh, this is very narrow and very specific. Uh, that's only true if you do not apply the catch-all clauses. We rely very heavily on software simulations and modelling and a lot of software tools that you work with would implicitly qualify as software specially designed or modified for the development, production or use of. I wrote a radio frequency microwave uh, tropospheric propagator algorithm as part of my PhD project nearly 20 years ago. Yes, okay it would fall under this. So that's an issue. So the all-encompassing definition of what is technology in the legislation presents what I have labelled as a cascade problem in the scope or coverage. This doesn't exist in the US legislation because of the exemptions. But any research that you're working in in an area that could be used to design or develop any goods or technology in a controlled category by, defa by default itself becomes controlled. And you can follow that cascade down as far as it leads. And the truth is, any technology can be used for a military purpose, ultimately. So if you can find a chain of dependency from whatever it is that works, or you're working with, that can be applied to a particular military application, the way this legislation is written, that gets picked up. What it means is that you could be working in an uncontrolled category and... Uh, whatever, and you think it's uncontrolled, but in effect because Joe Blow might be using X for a military purpose, then you can get yourself into trouble. So there's a difference in rationales here, which is the US lists were really developed to control commercial and government organisations. Uh, of course, you don't get the cascade effect in the American system because the exemptions... Uh, kill that dead at the research end. We don't have exemptions on this in, the, in, the, in the scope or scale or sense of ITAR and CCL. Uh, what that means is that regulatory scope can basically cascade almost arbitrarily. And that's getting back to what Kevin was talking about. Okay? That is not a well understood problem, basically. Summary, uh, really, what it means is if you want to test your research to see whether you are regulated by the Act, you first got to determine whether your 
technology is directly regulated, so the work I, some of the work I've done in radar and radar communications dead, okay? Then two, you've got to ask the question, do modelling and simulation tools fall under a D catch-all clause in some fashion? And that can be tricky, because you may not know, you're going to have to do some research. Or does the research itself that you're working in, or some part of it, fall under the E catch-all clause of any of the categories? So being outside of one doesn't mean you're outside of two and three. Okay. So that's all, thank you all. <laughs>